You're listening to The RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for The RN Mentor. Welcome to another episode of the RN Mentor Podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Ernest Grant with us, uh, the president of the American Nurses Association. Uh, Dr. Grant is a 36th president of the American Nurses Association. Uh, he has more than 30 years of nursing experience and is an internationally recognized burn care and fire safety expert and has conducted numerous burn education courses with various branches of the US military in preparation for troops deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan. In uh, 2002, President George W. Bush presented Dr. Grant with a Nurse of the Year Award for his work, treating burn victims from the World Trade Center site. He is also the recipient of the American Nurses Association Honorary Nursing Practice Award, for his contributions to the advancement of nursing practice. Dr. Grant is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and is the first man to be elected to the office of the president of the American Nurses Association. Uh, Dr. Grant's full bio can be and is can be found and is available on my website for all of our listeners. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Grant to the show. So welcome, Dr. Grant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Uh, thank you for your time. I know you're busy, uh, uh, but uh, I appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, giving us uh, some of your time to have a talk really about your career. And with all of my guests, I like to start with, um, how did you get started in nursing? Uh, wh- what, was, what was the motive? What was the motive behind that? Um, well, that would take up the whole program, <laughs> just about. Um I guess my career in, in nursing, I wouldn't say that it started by, uh, by accident, but uh, as I like to tell people, I, um, when I was in high school, I, wanted to, I knew I wanted to do something in healthcare, and actually I wanted to be an anesthesiologist, but I'm the youngest of seven kids uh, raised by a single parent. My, you know, my father passed when I was five, and um, there was, uh, we knew that there probably wouldn't be enough money for me to go to college. And uh, so my high school guidance counselor suggested nursing as a career. And he said, you know, you could go uh, become a registered nurse. Then if you really like that, you could become a nurse anesthetist. And if you still wanted to go to medical school, you could work your way through med school as a, you know, nurse anesthetist. It's a long way around, but, uh, and of course, this is like 40 some years ago. So, um, so I said, okay, we'll, you know, we'll give that a try. And he said, well, you might not like nursing. So why don't you take this one year program, uh, where you could become a LPN. And if you really liked it at that time, they were just beginning to have that transition course where, uh, if you completed, uh, the LPN and you wanted to go back to become an RN, you only needed to complete your second year as opposed to, uh, you know, starting all over again. So about six months into the LPN program, I decided, yes, this is, uh, you know, nursing was definitely my calling, forgot all about medical school, and uh, but then wanted to be able to do more for the people that I was caring for. So I decided to go back and instead of getting an associate's degree, went on and got the baccalaureate degree while working full time, and then uh, had that for about five years and then decided I wanted to get the master's because I still wanted to be able to do more for my patients. And then uh, probably about 25 years later is when I wound up finally getting the PhD. I, I wanted that, but uh, I got so busy doing uh, various things within the nursing profession that there wasn't time to do to devote to the studies that I uh, I needed for the uh, you know to get the PhD. So. 
So that's uh, that's the short version of that. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I mean, you went through a lot of different steps, and we have you know quite a few nurses that are now you know with the with the um, IOM report with the bridge mm-hmm. programs that are now in place. Uh, so you did kind of a version of that way yeah. ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, uh, so what was your motivation to like go for like I understand go moving into the nursing, but uh, what was your motivation around your master's uh, master's degree? I mean, uh, you um, have a background in in burn and things like that. Was that a motivation for you at all, or? Uh, yes, it was. Um, you know, I, again, I wanted to be able to do more uh, as as an advocate for my patients, and I began to look around. You know, because at that time, uh, the well, the one and only burn center that I worked at at the uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, in order to really uh, have your voice heard, I guess, and have that seat at the table um, and have credibility, I began to notice that, yeah, people who had master's degrees or doctorate degrees were the ones who were, you know, I, I shouldn't really say taken seriously, but, you know, but that's essentially the way it was, uh, you know, and uh, even though, you know, you had, uh, you know, you're at the bedside, you know, you're caring for the patient there, you do, um, you know, uh, research that, you know, would emphasize best practices and things of that sort, um, you know, but to really make a difference into the care of the patient and to, you know, to make that suggestion, you know, why don't we, you know, do this or do that or, you know, change this or, you know, when you're one of those disruptors, so to speak, which I guess is what I could consider myself, um, you got to have the credibility behind that. So that's what motivated me to, uh, you know, to go ahead and, and get the master's. And as I said, I wanted to get the PhD as well, but um, I was just got too involved in work as well as the work that I was doing within uh, not only uh, ANA, but also my state nurses association as well. Fantastic. Uh, I know um, for, I mean, for myself, whenever I you know, talk to colleagues or if I talked to uh, talk to my students or anything like that, I always tell them, uh, you mentioned the seat at the table. Uh, there is a credibility piece that goes with uh, mm-hmm. degrees and board certification. It really speaks to uh, really your professionalism. And I think that's what that brings to the table and, uh, what you're referring to. So yeah, I highly agree with uh, with that component with you that it's, uh, you know, going for your master's, going for your doctoral degree uh, may not necessarily change uh, how, um, what you think or what you're trying to advocate, mm-hmm. but it will give you the credibility that you need. So uh, thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Sure. Um, now you worked at a burn center. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, put you there and, and what made you specialize? Because it's not an area where we have a lot of nursing it. <laughs> <It's> uh, <cool. laughs> um, well, the official name of the burn center that I worked at is the North Carolina JC, and that's spelled J-A-Y-C-E-E, burn center. Uh, the JCs, um, as you know, is a uh, civic organization like the Lions Club or the Rotary Club uh, from across the country. And uh, the uh, the ones here in North Carolina, they um, put up the, the you know the first monies for the burn center, and I happen to be a member of that organization. Um, you know, from when I uh, left my hometown and had moved to the Chapel Hill area to uh, you know to work on my degree, and um, you know, and I figure, well, what better place to work than you know to show your allegiance, if you will, to an organization that you really believed in. Uh, you know, because we did a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fundraising for various organizations and uh, programs and things. And uh, the Burn Center was one of the, the ones. So um, when I interviewed, that was, you know, there was a position that was held, uh, you know, that was there. And they were, the, the Burn Center at this time was the only one of two um, uh uh, two ICUs that was still hiring LPNs because I was still an LPN at that time. I moved to this area to work on my baccalaureate degree, and but I had uh, ICU experience from uh, working in my my hometown uh, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, so I figured, well, okay, I'll do this for you know probably two or three years till I finish my baccalaureate degree, and then head on back to the mountains and you know let that be it. 
Uh, but again, about uh, you know a year into that, I realized that Burns was my calling, and um, you know everything I learned in nursing school, I get to apply there. You really get to see that you make a difference in somebody's life every day. Um, you really had to rationalize that. Okay, I'm going to work today to inflict pain. You know, because again, 40 years ago, we did not uh, use all the uh, or have all the techniques and things that we do today. Um, you know, for uh, you know for co- controlling the patient's pain. So pain was just viewed as a necessary part of the person getting uh, you know getting better. Um, but uh, you know, so you had to rationalize that in your your brain that you're going to inflict pain, but. Uh, you saw the end result. You know the you know the patients getting better. Uh, you know, of course, in a burn center, your patients are with you for a very long period of time, so you get to know them. You get to know their family. Um, you know, and I, I still have patients that I took care of. You know, thirty years ago, that I still you know have you know conversations with at least once a month. You know, it's like I'm their family. You know, you're invited to, you know, my daughter and now it's my grandkids weddings or, you know, or family funeral or a cookout or something like that. And, you know, uh, you know, so it's, you know, it's really great to uh, you really got a, a great sense that, like I said, you were able to make a difference in somebody's life every day. If it's somebody who was either transitioning from this world to the next or, you know, just for that period of time that you were with them for you know, three months, six months, or maybe even a couple of years, uh, you touch that person's life and, uh, and, and, and made a difference. That, that's one of the things that actually I, uh, I, I, I really love about nursing is uh, I, I've done both, uh, you know, uh, when I was in the, I was, you know, I served in the military mm-hmm. and yes. uh, I had um, my first duty station was at the Naval Medical Center, San Diego. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one of the first, uh, you know, first units I worked with were primarily uh, AIDS patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those patients were there and you get to and they were in and out all the time. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I really loved about that work is the fact that you spent so much time with them, getting to know them, knowing their family. Some, some of my fondest memories are when I was a corpsman at that unit and the families and the people that you interacted with all the time. So, uh, yeah. So something like a burn unit definitely, uh, yeah. lets you yeah. get to know the individuals. And then, um, later in my life, I ended up in an emergency room. So that connection <laughs> wasn't quite as yeah. uh, strong. But, yeah. uh, in this case, we had, you know, my particular facility, we took care of from pediatrics through geriatrics. So that's when I said that yeah. everything I learned in nursing school, you really got to apply in that setting. And it wasn't unusual that, you know, you pick up the phone and, you know, yeah, maybe a pediatric admission or it could be, uh, you know, an adult admission or a whole family, you know, as a result of a house fire or motor vehicle crash or something like that. So you really had to stay on top of your, uh, you know, your, your nursing skills. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate the work that uh, you did uh, with with the uh, with the burn center. I did a short stint in nursing school at the LA County uh, burn center, and uh, wow, what an experience that was! But uh, yeah, I admire you for for doing that work. Thank you. Um, so I want to move a little bit uh, forward in your career and uh, see how you got involved with with uh, with nursing organizations. Um, Because that's an area where uh, especially uh, new nurses coming into the profession uh, don't have a lot of experience with, don't know how to get involved, don't see, perhaps not even see the value in it. How did you get started in the nursing organizations and actually being an active member, not just a a dues paying member? How did you do that? That's a that's a great question. And um, I I guess I was one of the lucky ones who. it was preached to me, I guess you could say, by my professors, both um, in my undergrad and graduate courses, uh, the importance of belonging to your professional organization. And I guess what really triggered me was a colleague uh, about two weeks before I was due to graduate from my baccalaureate program. One of my colleagues at work came up to me and uh I can hear her voice right now. You know, she's a nice little Southern girl. And, you know, she goes, Ernie Graham, if you consider yourself a professional, then you need to join your professional association. <laughs> and she says, no, you're going to join NCNA and ANA, you know, because you could, uh, our state has the dual membership. 
And I said, yes, I, I plan to. No, you're going to join today. Here's the application right here. You fill it out. And, uh, you know, and I did. So uh, and, you know, 35 years later, I'm still <laughs> still a member. Uh, but uh, along with that, though, you know, like in a lot of nursing courses, perhaps your professors told you to go to your local district meeting or your local chapter meeting. And, you know, you got a little extra credit, but you had to bring back the agenda to prove that you were there or whatever. In my case, my professors were not only there, but they were also active as well. You know, they were uh, on committees or they were getting up to the microphone, you know, challenging or asking questions. And so they sort of served as a role model. So to me, it just seemed natural that, yeah, you would transition into doing that. And, you know, already, you know, knew the value of belonging to your professional association. But the more I got involved, once I graduated nursing school from my undergrad, you know, the, the more I got involved, the uh, the more I realized what a terrific value uh, it is and how it helps to balance your work. Uh, you know, uh, you're able to advocate more uh, on the behalf of your patients, on behalf of your, your workplace setting, um, you know, things of that sort. And plus having an employer who encouraged that as well really made a, a, a significant difference also. Um, so to me, it was just you know, uh, a no brainer, you know, that you would be uh, involved. And for the students that, uh, you know, today, that's one of the things I always tell them is that one of the best things you can do is to join your professional association because, you know, uh, you know, you need to have a voice in how your profession is, is, uh, is governed. And if you're not going to do it, somebody with an MBA who's looking, where can I cut corners or, uh, you know, they don't understand, you know, the needs of the professional nurse, you know, they're going to be making decisions for you. And uh, we can't sit back and let that person have that autonomy over us, uh, you know, without, you know, having an equal voice at the table. So, uh, you know, so that's one thing I always push to, you know, to uh, students that I work with now, or even just students that, that I see in general, it's very important, you know, they may not see the value of it, but the value is really there for you to belong to your professional association. So uh, one of the things that's always, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've struggled with, and maybe you can uh, shed some light onto this. Uh, how do we streamline belonging to uh, nursing organizations? Because, for example, I belong to four, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, it, and it, it gets expensive. Yes. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's, that's really a significant thing. Like if you were like, it's not a matter of, Oh, I can belong to an American nurse association and not my specialty organization. And there's, you know, things like Sigma Theta Tau and there's other organizations you want to you know belong to. Um, how do we streamline the process? Cause like I said, it gets pretty pricey and you have to yeah. pick and choose. Yeah. And what ends up happening is we have 4 million plus nurses in the U S but only a small fraction, even though the American Nurse Association is the largest mm -hmm. members, members, mem how, how do I say this? Member the largest organization. Member organization. Uh, thank you. Uh, but, but again, it's still only, what is it, about three or 400,000 nurses belong to the American Nurse Association. So mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of nurses that belong to nursing organization. How do we streamline so we have a more unified and strong voice when it comes to the nursing profession. That's that's very easy. Here's here's my my answer that I tell the students because they would say the same thing. Uh, you know, it costs too much, and you know, uh, and and my answer back is you can't you can you can't afford not to belong. So here's you know if you are going to belong to any organizations, there are three that you need to belong to. One is ANA and your state nurses association, which. Uh, for the most part, they have a dual membership. So, uh, you know, and so the, the price is, is much cheaper and, uh, you know, to be able to, uh, to do that. And the reason I say, uh, you know, for that is that your state nurse, uh, nurses association is going to advocate for you at the state level. You know, when your state uh, board of nursing or your uh, members of your your state government begin to write rules and regulations and things like that that may concern your practice, you know, that's where you need to be 
um, active and, and support your state association, but they are protecting your right to practice within your, your state. ANA does that on a much grander level, if you will, at the national level, uh, you know, working with members of Congress, working with various uh, organizations like, uh, you know, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare or, uh, you know, public health or, you know, and also just advocating for nurses in, in general. And perhaps later on, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, some of the work that uh, ANA has been doing, particularly doing COVID-19 right now, like advocating for PPEs and things of that sort. So uh, so that's the importance there. And then also belonging to your uh, your specialty organization. And the reason I say that is that they're going to provide you with the latest information or continuing education option of what's going on in your particular area of practice. Um, and you say you belong to four. I think I belong to about eight. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're paying more dues than I am. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and, and the other thing I will always tell them is that, you know, it's tax deductible. Uh, you know, so if you, you know, um, or if you're a new grad, um, the other thing I would tell students is that if you're a new grad, particularly if you're an older, um, you know, say if nursing is a, a second career, uh, you know, or whatever, and your your parents are trying to figure, okay, so what can I get for you for graduation or your grandparents? You know, tell them, get me a membership in my professional nursing organization. You know, they would, you know, they're old enough that they really understand the value of belonging and what that could do. So, um, you know, so that's a, a way to at least get them started. And a lot of them, uh, I know a lot of state uh, nursing organizations, they will offer the first year for a new graduate at half price. So, uh, you know, so again, you can slowly dip your toes in the water and and realize, you know, you've got a whole year to realize the value of, you know, of what you're getting and what, um, you know, what they can provide for you, but also what you can provide for them as well. Uh, so that's my answer to, you know, to, to, to that question. I'm going to put a pitch in for Sigma also. So if you're a oh, Sigma yeah. member. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you know, I've got ANA, NCNA, the American Burn Association. Uh, uh, that, that, uh, that's yeah. how it gets expensive. <laughs> that, that's how it gets expensive. Yes, so, it is. So, uh, moving from service to academia, you know, I took a significant pay cut. Uh, so when membership, my memberships, actually, I lost a couple of memberships just because it was not affordable anymore. But, you know, but there are there are so many. Uh, I, I just wish there was some some kind of cross breeding uh, between the organizations so you could flow from one to the other without losing the benefits uh, that, uh, yeah, in some places. And then yeah. the other thing, too, that you could do, I mean, what you're in, in academia is, you know, get your university to pay part of your your membership is, you know, keeping that up. And uh, and same thing for uh, you know, for students. Uh, one of the perks, if you will, that a lot of employers are beginning to offer now is also membership in their, uh, you know, they'll give them a choice, either, you know, their state. Uh, nursing organization or their professional association, and most people tend to choose their, you know, their specialty. But um, you know, but again, those are some options that they can think about that uh, perhaps they hadn't thought about before. Yeah, I love I love a couple of ideas you brought up as uh, gifting a membership to uh, new graduates. I think that's that's, uh, that's a brilliant uh, thought right there. I've never thought I you know I people think I I had a brilliant thought when my wife and I. Uh, instead of when we got married, uh, mm. instead of uh, getting stuff, we we registered for our honeymoon. So, uh, oh. so I, I love the idea of the gifting yeah, the membership. Uh, yeah. I might do that for my birthdays. Maybe that might be a, yeah. <laughs> add a couple of memberships to it. Uh, cool. And I and I really like and I really like the idea of organization. I know there's some organizations, but I think what I, what an awesome idea would be if every organization made that membership to at least the state or the American Nurses Association uh, a, a perk of being in the, being employed there. I think that is, that's, uh, I'm 100% on board with that. Well, um, well, that's a platform you know, I'm going to jump on. Uh, another thing, did, even, uh, you know, like membership as a uh, Christmas gift or an anniversary gift or, you know, whatever. And, you know, because again, as you get, older like we are. I'm probably older than, oh, I know I'm older than you. <laughs> Couple but, of years. You know, you can only have so many knickknacks, right? right? And 
you know, and et cetera. And you can only get so many ties and et cetera. But, you know, but just tell the family, hey, why don't, you know, three or four of the family members get together and buy that membership and, uh, you know, renew your membership in your professional association. It's another good yeah. way to do that. Or cash, either way. Yeah, cash. <laughs> Well, they give back, it may not go towards that membership. <laughs> I'm on board with the, both of those ideas. Uh, awesome. Uh, now, I really wanted to uh, kind of segue into, you know, you mentioned some of the things with the American Nurses Association. I'd really want to see uh, what your vision is with the American, or, or American Nurses Association and where we're looking at going um, from, a, from a national uh, perspective in the profession. Well, uh, you know, when I... Uh, was honored, I guess, uh, to to be elected as the uh, you know, the first male president of uh, of ANA, and you know that was uh, what about well, I'm the first male in 122 years. Uh, we will actually celebrate our 125th anniversary next year. Um, but I had four, well, actually six goals, and they were both nursing focus and public focused. Uh, from a nursing perspective, one was to um, to uh, increase the diversity of nursing. I think um, ANA should, uh, and we are, collaborating more with uh, minority nursing organizations to um, to embrace what they can bring to the table, um, and that nursing should be more reflective of the people that we serve, and not just. Perhaps what you see on a TV show, you know, as a blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, uh, you know, white, uh, you know, white female. Um, but that, you know, nursing comes in all shapes, size, colors. You know, uh, you know, we are who we are and we're a splendid representation of society. So, um, you know, so I have purposely uh, have uh, engaged uh, other minority organizations such as the uh, Hispanic Nurses, uh, the National Black Nurses Association, uh, the uh, the Filipino uh, uh, Nurses, the Indian Nurses Association, you know, all those are, you know, are coming in and we're having some really great dialogue. And some of them have joined as what we call an organizational affiliate. Um, you know, and my um, approach to them is to say, you do really great work for the population that you serve. I mean, if you think of like the, the National Black Nurses Association, they understand better than we do at ANA what's going on at the, you know, within the African American community. And I'm proud to say that I'm a member of MBNA as well. So, uh, but, and, and I don't want to, uh, for any of the organizations to think that ANA is coming in trying to tell you, you know, what to do or how to do this or that. Uh, no, we want to work with you to help get the message out or to, uh, you know, let's collaborate on some things together that, you know, when you talk about health disparities and, you know, in minority communities, what are some resources that perhaps we can uh, join together on, you know, to help try to eliminate that? And, you know, so let's use for an example, if uh, National Black Nurses are, are great at going in having conversations with members of the community, uh, either going to, you know, churches or synagogues or, you know, wherever to, uh, you know, to do health education, you know, it's perfectly fine. And then A&A can come in uh, by working at the national level, you know, work with members of, say, the um, uh, the um, Black Caucus in, in, uh, in Congress or, uh, or just, you know, Congress in general, to get more funds allocated to the underserved communities. And, you know, what are some of the, the ways that we can work together to say, you know, if you look at this particular community here, it's a, uh, it's a healthcare desert or, you know, someone in order to get healthcare, they've got to get on three different uh, buses in order to, you know, to, to get there. So they're, they're going to be thinking, well, I've got to take a whole day off from work just to see a doctor for 15 minutes, uh, you know, and, you know, whereas if we think about offering them a clinic at a local church, you know, run that clinic, why do, why do clinics have to run from eight in the morning till four thirty, five o'clock in the evening? Why can't they start at like two in the afternoon and run till 10 or 11 o'clock at night so that that person, you know, who really feels that I have to uh, work, uh, they value that over their health, 
Well, that gives them a chance to work. And when they get off work at five o'clock, then you can come to the clinic, uh, you know, at seven, eight or nine o'clock. And, you know, what's the difference? You know, the only thing is that we are meeting them on their level as opposed to them meeting us on our level. So that's some examples of how we can work together and still meet the needs and, you know, hopefully have far better outcomes, you know, far better healthcare outcomes been uh, doing that. So that's the first one of those. So the second one is obviously making ANA relevant to, to nurses. Um, you know, we want nurses to, to realize that ANA is the primary uh, resource that they, you know, that they can come to for accuracy and accurate information, for continuing education, for, uh, you know, to advocate on their uh, behalf as a profession, uh, you know, to, to have that full understanding. And then from the public understanding, uh, one, that the public, we already know the public trust nurses. I mean, obviously, for the last 18 plus years in a row, we've been uh, voted as the most trusted profession. But if you ask someone in the public what it is that nurses do, they don't know that. You know, they'll say, well, I know they work at such and such healthcare facility down the street, but they don't realize that we're everywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, we're in your community. We are a part of your community. So, uh, you know, if I'm going to advocate for, you know, with the local city councilman that, oh, you need to uh, fix this water supply or this water problem here or this, um, you know, this dry desert, if you will, you know, why aren't we getting fresh fruits and vegetables in here so that people will have the, the opportunity to have a, a more nutritious, uh, you know, choices and, and et cetera. Yeah. You know, if they know that I'm a nurse, then, you know, they're, they're going to go, wow, that's really, you know, this person, uh, and I'm not doing it. You know, I am doing it partly because I'm a nurse, but I'm also doing it because I'm a part of that community and I want my community to stay as healthy as, uh, you know, because it also, uh, you know, helps me. So that's uh, you know, that's one thing is having people in the community understand who we are as nurses and what we do and and what we're capable of doing, and then also getting them to uh, you know to, to understand that uh, you know we advocate on the on their behalf when it comes to say a local congressman who's running for office. We, you know we need to go to their uh, their town halls and challenge them or volunteer to be their healthcare expert. You know, when they're talking about various things, because their legislative assistants, they probably have gotten the information off of, you know, the uh, the Internet, maybe Wikipedia or something like that. That may be something they're not specializing in. But we, you know, as nurses, we all we're very resourceful. So if we don't know the answer, we know somebody who knows somebody who knows the answer. So those are some of the uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the the platforms, if you will. Uh, and we're making great strides with that. And then particularly over, you know, since COVID has, you know, has come into place, uh, you know, great strides, in, you know, throughout all of those. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One of my questions actually for you was going to be diversity, which you brought up as your mm -hmm. first point. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for addressing that. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, I said, I'm a member of four. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not of a Hispanic background, but I do belong to the Hispanic mm -hmm. Nurses Association out of Los mm -hmm. Angeles, which is, you know, LA is a, I mean, the mm -hmm. population of my students, the areas, mm -hmm. LA, uh, it, it just made sense for me to be a member of that organization and uh, kind of uh, involve, my, involve myself. Uh, and, and it's been uh, extremely uh, uh, fruitful for me uh, as an individual too. Uh, so you don't have to be of that, uh, 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 ethnicity or culture or anything like that to join, sure. uh, but it just sure. you know it does it does expand for anybody who's listening. Uh, uh, if you don't have have an association that speaks to your ethnic background, perhaps uh, it, you know um, looking at what other organization that you can uh, use as a learning platform. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you. Um, now uh, you know uh, you are the first. Uh, uh, male individual to uh, occupy the seat of president of American Nurses Association. Uh, and we, I know we've, uh, men in nursing overall has slowly uh, grown over the years. Uh, what do you think uh, is uh, the barrier or how can we, not, not so much barrier, uh, how do you think we can get more men interested in the profession? Well, I, I think that's already beginning to happen. You know, when I started in nursing you know, uh, 40 some odd years ago, uh, men represented about 3% of the, 
uh, you know, somewhere between three to six percent now, depending on who you read. Uh, we're as high as maybe twelve to fifteen percent of the um, uh, of the profession. So we're we're making great strides, and I think obviously, given you know, while we're having this conversation, it's right. Uh, I don't know where, maybe in the middle, or maybe at the peak of uh, you know of the uh, the COVID pandition, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. I'll learn how to talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> But, but um, uh, as nursing, you know, is more embraced by the public, and I, I think people begin to, you know, to realize truly who it is and what we do, um, you know, that more men who perhaps are looking for a second career will consider nursing as a career. Uh, you know, as I frequently tell, uh, you know, not only my students, but uh, people I meet in general, I have never regretted choosing nursing as a profession. Uh, if you remember the old uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, Eddie Murphy, you know, uh, such and such has been very, very good to me. Well, nursing has been very, very good to me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and I, I think as salaries are coming up and, you know, and et cetera, and you hate to, you know, to, you know, to sort of bring it that way, but we are finally getting some livable wages, if you will, that, um, you know, that is, um, makes the profession attractive for men to consider it as a, uh, you know, as an alternative to other parts of, uh, of, you know, other jobs that may be out there. Uh, but it just shouldn't be salary. It should be, a, you know, the fact that, you know, you, you've got the, uh, the ambition to want to help your, your fellow man, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's all it takes is just heart. In a lot of brain, because you got to remember those STEM courses. <laughs> uh, I agree. You need you need to have the brains to go with the with the heart, definitely. Um, now, um, do you think uh, just because I've I have over I want to say only over the last couple of years I've found some uh, incredible individuals that I've managed to stay in touch with from a mentor perspective. Uh, I've had I've had uh, uh, female mentors in the past. Uh, but just uh, having, you know, having a male mentor in the world of nursing, I think, is also as equally important. Uh, what can we do uh, from 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 that perspective, or, or do you think there are enough male role models out there um, for men in nursing? Um, that's a, that's a very tough question, and uh, it, because I uh, like you, I have actually both male and female mentors. Um, and, uh, actually one of my dearest, uh, mentor is, um, you may have heard of him, Dr. Gene Trambarger. Uh, Gene is well up to close to his nineties now, but, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, like one of the uh, original founders of, you know, the American Assemblies for Men in Nursing, along with Luther Chrisman, who I also had the, uh, you know, the, the pleasure of knowing, uh, the good thing about my, uh, mentorship with uh with gene is that you know i can pick up the phone and call him and i, I never will forget when i uh, when i uh, told him <clears throat> that i was considering running for you know for president of a and a and he said uh you know he gave me some, some very wise words and uh, part of it was that you know he says I, I i think it's time um you know i think you will you know you will will win compared to all the other men who've tried before you you know, from the 60s on, um, you know, and he said, but be careful what you wish for, because, <laughs> you know, which to me, you know, it didn't, it, it wasn't meant condescending. It was that, you know, you really have to uh, convince yourself that you're ready, you know, you know, to take on this particular role and also understand that you're going to be under the microscope because you're, you're the first one. And so people are going to be judging every move, every decision or whatever that you make. And so you, you shouldn't be second guessing yourself. You should, uh, you know, go in there knowing, <clears throat> you know, what you, you need to do. Now, that being said, um, you know, ANA has recognized that, uh, you know, there is a mentorship problem, if you will. And we have a uh, mentorship program um, actually, that started. I'm proud to say, right at the, as I was transitioning into um, my role as president, <clears throat> and for the first year, we had a little over 900 people to participate in that. And what we do is, um, new grads, we match them up with people who are um, 
seasoned um, and, you know, depending on what they would like to do, either as a result of, uh, you know, someone who's a new grad or someone who's transitioning, maybe it's an experienced nurse, but now they're moving into a leadership position or they're moving into, uh, you know, uh, maybe an academic, uh, you know, position, we're able to match them up with mentors, uh, you know, along that line as well. So, and a lot of those mentors, people who have volunteered, and this is all across the country, uh, you know, a, a great deal of those are men uh, also. Um, and then other organizations as well, like the uh, American Assembly for Men in Nursing, which I'm also a member of, and as well as you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, th about this group, I know when I first joined, you know, probably back in the 90s, uh, it was, you know, just all men, but now they've opened up to, you know, to, to women as well. And they, they've recognized that, um, you know, there's a lot that we all, you know, no, no matter if you're male or female, or what your, you know, your ethnic background may be, there's a lot that we can all bring to the table and someone could benefit from that. So uh, I'm beginning to see this this big tithe of um, of mentorship beginning to grow, and uh, very pleased that it is. <clears throat> uh, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, I mean, my biggest issue. Uh, I don't want to call it an issue. Uh, my biggest uh, challenge had been going from a predominantly male uh, uh, setting, which I was in the military mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Type of type of a role uh, coming into a profession that was predominantly female, and it does not operate on the same level. No, so, having, so having another male individual uh, yes. to, that I can say, hey, how do I navigate this water? Uh, uh, these waters uh, super important. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you're talking about profession as a whole, whether you have a you have whoever you have as a mentor, I think is a is a uh, definitely a positive. Uh, yeah. Having a mentor period, I highly. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but one of your 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 comments that you just uh, sort of mentioned reminded me of the best advice I ever got uh, from a nurse, and it happened to be a female nurse. Um, you know, who said, um, "Don't let them use you as an orderly." You know, of course, back then, you know, those who may be listening, we probably go, what's an orderly? Well, <laughs> well, forty some odd years ago, that was a. Uh, uh, you know, th today's version of a nursing assistant, you know, someone who perhaps didn't have all the skills that uh, a certified nursing assistant would have today, but they would do various, you know, like the, the heavy lifting and, you know, and, and things of that sort. And, um, you know, and that nurse told me, she, you know, she said, you are a nurse. So, you know, but don't let, you know, my colleagues treat me as if I am a glorified orderly. And I, uh, got the, the the chance to experience that when uh, uh, you know probably I don't know sometime later on someone said oh can you help us lift this patient into you know a chair you know and when they kept doing it you know over a period of two or three days and et cetera and I said you know I don't mind helping you uh, you know but why are you coming to me and it's oh because you're strong I said well what would you do if I wasn't here. You know, if it was all females on, on the floor, what would you do if I wasn't here? And I got them to, you know, to, to really think about things and to, you know, um, you know, and of course they knew that I would, you know, be more than happy to help. But, you know, it's one way to, you know, to, to ask because it's a colleague. It's another way to ask because you're a male, you're big, you're strong, and, you know, and uh, I'm going to save my back by, you know, by, by doing that. Uh, so this is just something that's always just stuck out. But, you know, when you think of mentorship, uh, you know, the, the mere fact that uh, and it was an older you know, female, you know, just about ready to retire. Uh, but, uh, you know, but recognize that. And of course, she was a she was an old hospital diploma grad. So there, <laughs> therefore, that would would tell you that uh, she knew her stuff and and also knew that, uh, you know, sometimes people would want to take advantage of you and stood up for that. Yeah, that's that's um, that's great. Uh, like I said, I've had I've had a lot of mentors uh, over the years, and uh, just you know, it's nice to have nice to have a diversity uh, yes. in in mentors, just because you get different perspective, and I think that's uh, that's definitely key. Uh, <clears throat> now, I, I, I warned you ahead of time about uh, you had mm -hmm. you had an opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, visit the White House recently mm -hmm. over Nurses Week. Uh, mm -hmm. 
know, how, how did that visit go? Because in the media, the visit really concentrated on on one aspect of the visit, which primarily uh, showed uh, uh, one of one of the nurse representatives talking about shortages in PPE. Mm -hmm. the president countered that with another nurse chiming in, mm -hmm. saying, "Not an issue at my hospital." Uh, so that kind of, I think, the whole premise of that meeting kind of went out the door when that happened and what the media covered. Uh, what was your experience uh, during that session? Oh, well, my experience was, um, you know, well, just what you know, everyone saw. But, uh, you know, obviously, we're honored and happy that the, you know, the president wanted to recognize nurses and proclaim National Nurses Day. Uh, I think that, um, in essence, um, maybe the, the, you know, the, the meaning or the uh, you know, the focus of the day may have, uh, you know, gotten out of, out of hand, but it's also, you know, both nurses were, you know, were speaking the truth because the supply chain is just beginning to open up. And, you know, in some areas of the country, there are, you know, people who are still uh, stating that they have a shortage of PPEs. And uh, just because some people who may um, be fortunate enough to work in a perhaps a large metropolitan area and, you know, their facility was able to, you know, to get that supply. Someone else who works in another area of the country or, you know, it could be even be the same state, uh, you know, their facility is still having difficulty, you know, uh, acquiring those. So, um, um, you yeah, know, that's pretty much it. Yeah, because uh, I know, I mean, going back to the PPEs, I know, like, mm -hmm. I, I live in L.A. County, so mm -hmm. uh, even in L.A. County, there was, uh, we had a significant shortage, because I, mm -hmm. I know that from my colleagues and students, yeah. uh, or, you know, my, my graduate mm -hmm. students that are working and saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, social media, they're, they're even, you know, saying, you know, how they're having to store their PPEs and reuse them and uh, definitely concerning, you know, uh, knowing what we know is evidence-based practice and what we had to resort yes. to because mm -hmm. of uh, the shortage. So I uh, just want to give you an opportunity to <laughs> address what happened in the, yeah. in the Oval Office. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which uh, well, uh, the, the only other thing I'll say is that the, the Oval Office is not as large as a lot of people think it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the Ronald Reagan Library, which is in LA, uh, has a replica, so that's the closest mm -hmm. I've gotten to one. Uh, but yeah, it's not that big. I agree. Yeah, no, it is not. Um, so uh, thank you so much. Um, anything else you want to uh, share with our? Uh, uh, with our audience as far as uh, where you're hoping to take the American Nurses Association moving forward or any uh, words of wisdom uh, you'd like to share? Uh, certainly. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> as much time as you need. Uh, I, uh, you know, well, well, first of all, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ANA is celebrating its 125th anniversary next year. Uh, this year, as we all know, was designated as the year of the nurse and midwife, and it didn't quite, you know, the, the celebration that we planned sort of got, uh, you know, a, a different focus, uh, if you will. But I, I think the uh, the country still got to recognize who we are as nurses and, and what we do. Um, I like to say that without nurses, there is no health. And so to answer your question where I'd like to take the, a, uh, the ANA for the next a uh, couple of years. I am running for re-election right now, so hopefully in the next three weeks we'll find out <laughs> if I'm re-elected or not. But uh, but my uh, my goals is again having that uh, you know that relevance of the you know the the, the public uh, really having a greater understanding and greater respect for nurses. Um, also, serve notice that uh, you know what is our new normal um you know the the image and the the future image of nursing has got to step it up um you know we're you know we're not going to go back so to speak uh, you know with there's a fair amount of rules that were relaxed that uh, allowed for you know full practice authorities for APRNs and for for nurses and uh you know we're working right now to make sure that those rules become permanent and not just temporary and you know, it's it's weird to say that um you know well there are 22 states that already have that but it's it's weird to say that okay it's okay to do this 
during an emergency, you know, during a time when you would think, oh, a lot of mistakes and things like that can occur, uh, but not during, you know, what I would consider peaceful times or, you know, during normal operations. So we have more than proven ourselves um, of the ability to, you know, to, to be resilient and to take on those those challenges. And so um, the, the new norm for uh, for nursing, if you will, is that, you um, uh, you know, we're going to embrace technology innovations, uh, you know, step the profession up, have a, a even bigger voice. You know, we're 4.3 million, um, you know, the, the largest portion of the healthcare system, but yet you're still, you know, counted in as the room and board for a, a lot of healthcare facilities. There's something wrong there. When other professions are able to build for their services, like you think of physical therapy or occupational therapy or, you know, uh, you know, then why not nursing? You know, why can't we have that, uh, you know, that possibility as well? So um, I guess sort of to uh, let's just say it's uh, <laughs> we're going to look at all possibilities and, uh, you know, see where where we can be in the, you know, within the next couple of years or so. But we definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's my goal, hopefully, that we will not go back to the pre-COVID era, but, uh, you know, blaze a trail for what we would consider the new norm for the nursing profession. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'd love to stay on and talk to you more, but I want to be uh, respectful of your time. Uh, well, we can uh, do another one. That we can do a follow-up. Definitely. hundred percent on board with doing a follow-up. We'll make it, we'll make this a regular event. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, again, uh, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for your vision. Uh, I just you you mentioned something with full scope of practice and uh, unfortunately California it's not where we would like it to see and it's come up on a few of my podcasts that California is not uh, one of those states and would love to see that move forward as well. Uh, so thank well, you for your- North Carolina is the same way, but uh, we we'll 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 get there. We'll get there. We'll get definitely get there. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, you have been listening to the RN Mentor Podcast, and we'd like to again thank Dr. Grant for his presence here today and wish everybody a fantastic day. Thank you. Have a good one. You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Tayeb. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.